well, it was something I always wanted to do from the time I was very little. I can remember when I was about seven, uh, a beekeeper came into the primary school and I was just fascinated with all the stories and the, 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 the objects and the smells that were linked to it. So that's when I really was uh, taken by the bug. But it wasn't until, uh, gosh, I'd gone through career and family and all the rest of it, you know, and uh, so I suppose I was about 30, 35, and I said, right, you know, I think I might start doing it. Mm. If you think of attraction as an expression of feeling, attraction and repulsion, which are aspects of nature, they used to be regarded as literally forms of feeling. So when the earth is attracted to the sun, that's an expression of eros, of, uh, of love, relationship, expressed as attraction. But you can also have expressions of feeling that are repulsion. And so attraction and repulsion, which have gone into physics as something purely mechanical, have their origin, of course, in, this, in feelings. And now in contemporary physics, feelings are gradually being put back into molecules. They were taken away, they're being put back in. So that you can talk about these processes of what I call natural processes, doing their own thing in the most natural way. You can see it also, and I use the term not just minimal effort, but maximum grace. And if you use the term maximum grace, what you're saying is it feels good to the molecules to go into that state. It's like a dancer or an athlete who feels fantastic when they're doing a slalom run or a ski jump, and they're doing it perfectly. So it just feels like the most natural thing to do, but it's the most beautiful and graceful at the same time. So you can see the whole of the cosmos expressing this kind of relationship, in which what physicists call minimal energy, and, and that's a, a major principle in physics. It's a contradiction that people are trying to resolve, and some people do it in one way by denying the reality of, subject, of subjective feelings, and other people are saying, well, if these feelings are real, they must have come from somewhere. There must be an antecedent property, and that antecedent property is some kind of, whatever you want to call it, uh, ur feeling, a primordial feeling. In, in matter, in energy. And so you begin to get this dissolution of the boundary between nature and culture. So that we can now begin to talk about uh, nature in the same terms that we use for culture. And we do it spontaneously. I mean, that's, people have been doing that for, for years and years and years. And it's just this curious um, scientific tradition that has denied the subjective and the feelings that has been problematical.
it's a lovely, delicate creature with a most highly refined, let's call it intellect, okay? Sensitivities to changes in the environment that we just can't detect, you know? Um, methods of communication that are so subtle that we can't approach it, you know? Tiny vibrations of a certain frequency, tiny imperceptible molecules of, of, of chemical substances that, that trigger particular behaviours and mean certain things, you know, incredibly subtle uh, creature and very, very delicate. So we just, it's not surprising that, you know, eventually it does suffer if we don't look after it and look after the environment, which is what supports the bee after all. You've got to think of this in three dimensions. What we've got here is a kind of a hemisphere, all right, yeah. with a set of shells around that. Yeah. So I've taken out a section, haven't I? Yeah. And here's the shell around of the honey over the top. Then there's a dome around the nest of pollen. Can you see that? Yeah. And then in the very centre of what potentially is a circular nest, is this, um, these cells here. Now these cells are actually sealed in larvae. And what you've got here, all this is the honey they've stored up, okay, in an arch over where the um, brood nest is. And they've sealed it in with wax. And so you open it up and you see all the honey there sealed in, okay? And if you look just here, in these cells, there are these colored dots, red, sort of greenish, yellow, pink, that's pollen from different species of plant. That colour, that really red colour, comes from horse chestnut, because it's so characteristic, most beekeepers know that. But where these yellow and creamy and pink ones come from, I don't know. But the, the, what it shows here is this, that they are very constant bees. They, when they're bringing in pollen, they only bring pollen from one particular species. That's each a particular pollen-gathering bee. And the, this honey becomes a sort of carbohydrate part of the diet for energy and the pollen is the protein and vitamin part of the diet. Mm -hmm. 